Nice tap. Embrace the flavor of life. The way I see it is you've got two choices. You can either keep pretending like nothing bad's ever gonna happen to you, and then when it does, you're saying, uh-oh, or you can get ahead of what's coming so that when it does, not if, you're ready for it, and you're sitting pretty, sipping on Mai Tais next to the pool, working on that Caribbean suntan, because you got it covered. So folks, it's time for you to learn the truth about money. It's time for you to take back control of your money so that you are ready for what's about to happen. By doing that, you're setting yourself up for absolute success. No matter what comes your way, you're ready for it. And that's what I want for you, and I wanna help you with that. So go to chrisnoggle.com and sign up for the Wealth Webinar. We do them every Wednesday at 1 p.m., and you need to be there because it's time. For over 90 years, we've been crash testing our cars in the tireless pursuit of automotive safety. At Volvo, safety's been first since 1927. We've saved millions of lives with the invention of the three-point seatbelt in 1959. At Volvo, we've made driving safer for you and them. Visit safety.finleyvolvo.com to learn more. So they say if you give a man a gun, he'll rob a bank. But if you give a man a bank, He'll rob everybody. The good news for you is Private Money Club runs solely on peer-to-peer -peer relationships, which means no banks allowed. So finally, there's a community for real estate entrepreneurs where it is truly a win-win solution. This community is a place where you can connect with other lenders and other borrowers, and the end results, massive growth for you. You get to build your real estate empire, and you get to do it solving other people's problems. So if that sounds like a place you want to be, well then join us. Go to privatemoneyclub.com forward slash Kelly. And if you want 500 bucks off, just add the code Kelly500 and I'll knock 500 bucks off the premier membership. We'll see you on the inside. <laughs> Welcome to the Kelly Cardenas Podcast, where attitude is everything. On today's show, you're going to hear about perseverance. Uh, you're going to hear about relationships. You're going to hear about locking in and, and that there's a time for every single purpose that there is that uh, on this planet. And this man that I got a chance to become friends with, I'm going to force him to be my friend for the rest of his life, uh, April uh, 24th. 2020 is the first time that I reached out to him. I reached out to him because I, I connected with him on Instagram and I wanted him on the show because not all the things that he did, but I saw him the way that he connected with his family, the way that he loved his wife. And oh, by the way, he did a lot of really cool things also. Um, so I, I want to ask you the question, every one of you out there. What do you think that Friends, Third Rock from the Sun, the Dixie Chicks, uh, CMT, the Weather Channel, and the Tennessee Titans all have in common? <laughs> I bet you can't guess it. Though uh, it, it comes down to two words, Lance Smith. This man is an absolute powerhouse, and when you feel his energy here in a second, you'll see why I've been chasing after him for almost four years. And I, I think one of the coolest things in, in getting to uh, know him through researching what he's been doing is the relationships and realizing that if you're ready at the right time, then great things happen. And when you step through the doors that get open to you, it's incredible. So it's my honor, my pleasure, uh, my new friend for the rest of my life to be able to have on the show. And he is the voice of the, uh, he says he's the voice of the fans. I say he's the voice of the Tennessee Titans. Uh, this man is an absolute legend. Please welcome to the show, Mr. Lance Smith. Hey, thank you so much for that really warm introduction, Kelly, who's now my <laughs> friend for the rest of my life. I, I'm down with that. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, Lance, a long time coming, man. Long I'm time telling coming. you, dude, four years, man. I mean, well, it's almost four years, but I, I've told people in the past, my, my parents told me... Um, that I had the spirit of Jacob, which <laughs> meant that I was going to grab onto something. And even if you broke my hip, my leg, my ankle, whatever it was, I wasn't going to let go until I got it. And that's what I'm doing with your friendship, man. I love it. I love it. It's a way to be. I mean, you kind of have to be in life, right? If you want anything, if you want anything, don't you have to like not just go after it, but reach for it and grab it and hold on. No, that's great, man. Thank you. So, so Lance, one of the most fascinating things is I grew up in a place called Lompoc, California. And um, in near Vandenberg Air Force Base, on Vandenberg Air Force Base and, and near it. Um, our friends were still the same friends since we were in fourth grade. And a lot of people asked, you know, how can you keep these friends? And it was because I had to move 
every two and a half to three years, we were in a different residence. We were constantly moving. You were on the move and you used it as your superpower. Can you share with us about that? Because I think it's so, so, because a lot of times people see it as a weakness. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you. And that, that is it's sort of what shaped me. Um, so I'm glad you brought that up because that's why I'm here. That's why I do what I do. Oh, by the way, Mike Keith is the voice of the Titans now. He's the man. <laughs> I'm merely just the voice of the fans, by the way. The Vought, as we call him, Mike Keith. We, we love Mike Keith. No, um, no, Kelly, it's it's the same. So, yeah, uh, they, they called you guys uh, Army Brats or Navy Brats, depending on your, your the service. But I ran into a lot of those kids moving up moving around too but when i was growing up i grew up predominantly in the south in franklin tennessee but we moved back there a lot i moved into that town four times i lived all over tennessee i also lived in georgia i lived in hawaii i lived in north carolina this is all during my my school years and the thing that i realized early on i mean i had been in four or five different schools by the time i was in the second grade i quickly quickly learned as a kid that we are all just character types, you know, and the older we get, the more we we're we're affirmed in these types, these these characters uh, and we all play them, you know, and we to, to this day, we all do this. Um, and it's, you know, we are products of nature and nurture. And this is something I learned in psychology in high school, but I already had an innate sense of it because growing up, I understood that, you know, you are, you are half your DNA from your parents and you're also half whatever the environment throws at you and shapes you to be. So in moving a lot, I kept having to reinvent myself. I kept having to reintroduce myself. Oftentimes as a kid, especially a teenager in middle school, whatnot, you know, you go over the line too much. Not, not, not that character too much. Not that character. I was that kid. Uh, but by the time I got out of high school and was ending high school and I, I recognized what I wanted to be in life. I was trans taking that my, my knowledge of character study and human behavior that I had just learned over time through moving. I wanted to apply that to film. I, I, love characters. I love story. And so it was my moving all over creation, watching my father work a room. My dad is the original Foghorn Leghorn. Um, I was like, I can, I can make a business of this. <laughs> so talk to me too, because I think that this is a, a thing that a lot of people struggle with. They set out on one mission, right? Mm -hmm. And even mm -hmm. though that mission doesn't go exactly the way that they want it to. They try and force that thing. You are an example of you set out on a path <laughs> mm, mm. And, and that path was not straight at all. We were talking about that before we started recording, but it's one of the things that I admire most about you because you have taken every single opportunity and you just made the best of it. Thank you. Yeah. Yes gets yes. You know, work begets work. That's the whole thing. And I tell, I, I teach acting now. I coach actors, uh, you know, along with directing. And my passion is what they're doing because I did it. Uh, and it is. It's like I tell them, you know, get in this game and you have a light that's sort of pulling you. You want that thing. But your want of that thing is is what's propelling you. It's your want of it, your desire of it, your need for it. Whatever it is in your life, you, you're filling that. But the light is not it. It's your want of the light that's thrusting you forward. And when, you know, along the way, especially in a career like this, opportunities show up. I wanted to be an actor, but there was an audition to be a host. I'll give that a shot. <laughs> I can talk to the camera. Have you ever read a teleprompter? Yes. And I tell my actors that in this profession, it is okay to lie. How old are you? However old you need me to be. You, you lie all the time in auditions. It's the one area that God says it's cool. It's cool. Just get the job. Um, and I, I told them I knew how to read a teleprompter. I didn't. I, I mean, like, how hard could it be? Turns out it's kind of difficult sometimes. Uh, ear prompter. Yeah, sure. Bring it to me. I've done that before. No, I hadn't. But, you know, my dad, it was my dad that always that told me that first told me in life. And you, know, you hear it later is act like you've been there. And so that's what I did at every audition at every, you know, opportunity was, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, I've, I've done this before. I've got it. And uh, and so, yeah, you 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 take the open doors. Now, I, I will say um, my later on my my desire, my want, my need. I'm still an actor. I'm still an actor. I'm pushing for it. I'm pushing for it. 
I, I, I got ahead. I got over the tips of my skis, as they say. And, uh, I, you know, things kind of went wonky for me and I had to get back to center and like, okay, let's, let's be open to opportunity again, because that's when I was at my most, uh, my happiest in my career was when I was open to opportunity and walking through those doors and not always forcing it, forcing it. <laughs> Lance, how, do, how does a person who's setting out to be an actor end up the face of CMT MCing for the Dixie Chicks and yeah. then on the Weather Channel and the voice of the fans for the Tennessee Titans? <laughs> to, to keep it short and all, <laughs> all like combined, it's just knowing the audience, man. It's knowing who the audience is, knowing what the brand wants to say to the audience. And as a host, you're the conduit. You're the conduit for their message. Uh, you are the vessel. You know, you represent the brand. And understanding CMT, the CMT audience was easy. I grew up in Franklin, Tennessee. I grew up watching CMT and MTV and VH1. That was my babysitter. So getting the job with CMT uh, led to the Weather Channel job. That's the thing is like once you have a high profile enough on camera position, other jobs come calling. Same thing with CMT. People behind the scene or not CMT, but with the Titans, people behind the scenes uh, were aware of me. I knew some of them and they had an opening and they said, you know, he'd be great for this, this guy. So, you know, in this business, if you can make a big enough splash early on, that'll the, that the ripples, the waves will carry you some. But in order to do the job well, once you get there is you have to know the audience. You have to know who they are, what they want, what they don't want. <laughs> and and cater to them in a way without pandering. Mm. Audiences audiences know when they're when they're being pandered to, and you know you, you get close to it sometimes uh, with depending on the job the messaging, but you can't pander. That's the thing. It's like you have to respect them, speak to the core, the center, and uh, and be real, be of them. You know, and so. When I walked away from CMT, I just I had, I had had enough. I realized like this is not who I am. This is not who I am now. I am grateful for the opportunity, but I I have we have diverged in our paths, and uh, you know I, I needed a change. I made the change, and so I, anytime in my my life that I've needed to make that change, it's always been because I've grown out of it. And uh, and if you if you are a host, and I tell this to my actors, if you're a host, and this is very important for everyone watching, listening, that, that wants to speak to any audience. If if you are a host and you're on camera versus being an actor, the, the two different things are: as a host, you are delivering from your face and your mind. It's all projected. It's all direct. What I'm doing to you right now, staring down the barrel of the lens. Uh, but what you're giving is you're attaching this face, your name, your identity to the brand. And that logo is probably on the screen somewhere. Maybe it's a little bug at the bottom. Uh, Jeff Foxworthy brought me on stage one time to present an award at one of the CMT Music Awards. And I'll never forget his line, the writers wrote. And now coming to the stage, a guy whose face is on the network more than the logo. Because I was. I was. I hosted every show for CMT. You have to recognize that it's brain and face. Now, acting, mm -hmm. acting comes from the heart and the soul and the gut. And you have to forget that this thing even exists. You have to forget that it's there. You honor the audience by giving them your truth and living truthfully in the moment. That's what acting is. But you have to disengage completely from the crowd. So that's the difference between hosting and acting. But when you host, you are of that brand and it is of you so you have to respect that and it can't just be i'm the mouthpiece for what brand is it? ritz crackers i'm the mouthpiece for you know you can't you gotta be like i am mr ritz crackers <laughs> i don't know why i use that brand arbitrary <laughs> <laughs> we're actually gonna have them as a sponsor coming soon right which be good I, well my, my son yeah, likes Kelly's ritz crackers crack. <laughs> that'll be good how, how do you not lose yourself as you go through this, Lance, because you talked about some of the transitions, even before we uh, started recording, um, you let me know that you, I got to spend time with you today in an interesting time in your life. But when you're an on air host, you're the face of CMT, you're the MC for the Dixie Chicks, do over a thousand, let me say that again, over a thousand shows. Yeah. And now you're the 
voice of the fans for the greatest team that has ever been. Let me mention, that's the Tennessee yeah. Titans, by the way. I just wanted to let you right. know. That's right. That's right. Okay. But how do you not yeah. lose yourself when you're playing to the audience? Mm, I mean, I, I think I sometimes do lose myself. I lose myself, you know, in the the hype of it. Uh so I was done with on camera because I, I really I needed to get back to creating film. And when CMT, CMT, I keep doing that again, Titans came, call, came calling. Um, it was it was an easy it was an easy yes to that gig because I'm like, oh, but this I I, I bleed two tone blue. I'm a huge Tennessee Titans fan. Uh, so I, I that job is just losing yourself. But I guess you do it with. You know, you do it with your own internal parameters you know hype it up within <laughs> these parameters but as far as like not losing yourself overall in the gig i don't know i i, I think you have to um keep your distance you have to not let it get bigger than you um i remember at my height of cmt i get that part right i had my time with cmt i i had i was finding myself like going away a lot, being alone a lot. And I, and I, I realized I needed to make a separation then. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. It's just it, keep what's important in front of you. Now it's easy. Now it's easy because my family is the number one most important thing in my life. So it's like, just keep them in front of me and everything's gravy. <laughs> well, I, I think one of the coolest things too is the, the relationship side because you just said, mm -hmm. you know, when the Titans came calling, you knew a couple of people. Let's go back mm -hmm. though. Let's go back to mm -hmm. the Dixie Chicks part. Um, yeah. when that, when that arose, how did it arise? Take us there. Um, mm -hmm. you're, you're working as an actor. How does, mm -hmm. I mean, that doesn't even, again, it doesn't align, but that's what I love about it is because there's so many times where people think that the success or their path has to be linear as opposed mm -hmm. to going with what it is. Yeah. You do have to have a really great sense of blind faith going into, uh, the entertainment business. Uh, would you be an actor if you're auditioning for things? I mean, you have to have you have to have a greater a great sense of self awareness. Know what you truly give off. Know what you're truly delivering. Um, but then you have to fully commit. And so, you know, when I got the Dixie Chicks gig, I had done some small things, but getting that was you know a big audition. And I remember going into the audition. And it was, you know, there was a script, they call them sides, you read the sides, and it, it's a bunch of hype words, like we're, you're bringing the girls on stage, basically, is the way the script read out. And I'll, you know, what I applied in that moment was the same thing that, you know, I tell my actors to apply, even though they're two different, uh, two different methods of getting to your audience, one is very direct, one is just living in the moment, but it is about fully, fully committing. I asked my boss when I got the chicks job, why me? And he said, he said, cause you kept running off camera, uh, that my energy was so exciting. See, I, I was breaking rules. Like when you audition, there's a T mark and you stand on it and you stay within the frame and you, you don't, but basically like, if this is a frame, I was like, ah, ah. and he was like, we couldn't stop laughing. But he said, but when you, when you got into the camera, into the lens, you were so committed and, and so alive. So any job you do, you just, you have, I mean, I can't say that word enough commit because what is the point of get, if you get up there and, and you know, I tell people when I'm working with them, coaching them on emceeing and stuff, like I'm a not, I'm not a technically a good MC. I'm technically not a good anything. I break all the rules. I do all the wrong things. <laughs> Uh, but, but if the, if the audience believes that you believe it, if you believe it, they believe it, that's it. Everything else you can refine, you know? Uh, but if you get on stage and you're like, Hey guys, aren't we really happy to be here? Are we happy? Like you're not talking to third graders. You got to <laughs> believe that you are first happy to be here. You got to believe that whatever you're hosting, whatever you're doing is like, this is for me. I'm glad y'all could be here too. But this is this football game is mine. I'm glad you 62,000 people could join me in this game that they're playing for me or this concert that they're putting on for me. I'm glad y'all could be here too. That's it, man. It's um so every job I've ever done, I'm just like, okay, I, I'm in the audience. 
I'm in the audience. I'm in the audience. What do I want to see? Who, I, who do I want to talk to me? How do I want them to talk to me? I want them to be me. So that's it, man. Be truthful. Be truthful in your approach. Be the audience. Respect them. Don't pander. Mm. Um, but, it, but you know, when I say don't pander, it doesn't mean you can't go wild. It doesn't mean you can't lose your mind. <laughs> but it's got to be real. It's got to come from a place of realness. Well, I think I think it's such a cool thing because going to Titans games and you know growing up on the um, growing up an Oilers fan from when I was yeah. six, I was never around any Oilers fans because I lived in Idaho, Utah, Florida, and California. Oh, yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Like that, those aren't places where they are. And I remember going for the first time, and I remember uh, it was three years ago when we beat the Chiefs, right? And we oh, good game. Hey. We handed Patrick Mahomes the only game in the history of his career where he didn't throw a touchdown. And that yeah. was because of the Titans. And I was yeah. there and I remember hearing your voice and hearing those things. Like it was unbelievable because when you're saying it now, it makes so much sense. I could yeah. tell that you believed and that you were a real fan. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad it comes across. I don't know. couldn't do it any other way. Like I couldn't. Now, granted, like, could I do that job for any other team in the NFL? Honestly, my professionalism, yes. Would I want to? No. Will I ever? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, like I wouldn't Jacksonville, forget about it. You know, but um, you know, could I? I would apply the same method, you know, but in Tennessee, it's just it's far more genuine because it's so real. And I mean, I I mess up a lot of times because I'm such a fan. We were doing a bit one time where uh, I had to play a game with some fans. Uh, we're down the south end zone on the field. It's a timeout, and I've got these two fans here. And luckily, it was a bit. Like, it was a setup. Like, whether win or lose, the game didn't matter. They were getting gifted something from the Titans. So it was a setup. But the setup was we were playing a game. However, prior to us going to the commercial break, we know. We get a, an idea. Okay, next next timeout, next whatever timeout, we're going to break. Like, okay. But unfortunately, right before this moment, I'm in the south end zone, and – it's a goal line stand. It's a fourth down goal line stand on our, our defenses up against the wall. And they hold. They hold. The crowd's going nuts. So am I. I scream with or without a mic. I don't care if the camera's on. I mean, I'm in the game, and the boys are like 10 feet away from me. We just had a goal line stand. I couldn't breathe, Kelly. I had lost my mind, my voice, my breath, everything. And, and I'm like, ah, beating my chest. And I hear Duke was our PA announcer at the time. Let's throw it down to Lance <laughs> on the field. Lance, who are you with? And I'm going, <gasps> and I can't, no, I can't. And these poor people are just standing there, like, not knowing what to do. And I'm just like, that's over game. Roll the tape. <sighs> and I screwed up the moment. And it's because I'm just too big of a fan. So, I should probably rein it in sometimes, but you know. <laughs> How do you know when it's time to to switch when you're done? You know, when you said uh, your your transitions have been amazing from the acting world, Dixie Chicks, CMT, oh. the Weather Channel. You know, uh, coming into the Titans and then um, staying yeah. with the Titans. You have the show for six seasons. You and Eddie George do it. Um, yeah, and then you say like, I want to go behind the camera. But you seem so peaceful every single time you talk about the, the thing where a lot of us, the audience, mm -hmm. when we go to transition, we just don't let go. We want to keep pulling it back. We want to say, oh, my gosh, what could have been? What should have been? And then they live in that. But you seem to not do that. How do you do that? Uh, you know, I don't know if my answer is right or if it's the one that people should hear. Uh, a lot, some of it, I was, I will say, and I'll admit it. I don't know that I've ever really thought about it that much until now. I think some of it's out of fear. Um, I left CMT in a weird way, going back to then. You know, ten years. I was their original sort of VJ. Katie Cook's still there. What's up, Katie? Uh, and she's killing it and she's loving it. And she's a musician, you know, that's her, that's her world. But for me, again, I had mentioned I'd grown apart and I'll never forget my, my executives at the time pulling me in in different meetings, asking me to stay. I had a three-year contract on the table, money on the table. I was making really ridiculous money for somebody who didn't go to college. And I, it's the voice in my head. 
Um, that's how you do it. You, you have to listen to that voice. And that, because that voice has, has said some strange things to me throughout my career. I've made weird decisions. Um, you got to listen to that voice in your head. Honestly, um, I, I left money on the table. I left, left a big contract on the table. Why not stay with that job? Because it wasn't truly me anymore. Yeah, I had to believe in myself. What did I want? I still was saying acting because that's all I knew about film. It was all about film. It wasn't acting. It was acting is the only thing I knew how to do, right? I, I, I never said I wanted to be a director, even though I look back on my love of film. And, oh, it wasn't the actors. It was the filmmakers. It was the directors. Um, so it was always listening to that voice. I would always walk away when I felt when I felt I had done all I could do. And then all that was left of me was an echo of what I had done. And I think maybe that's the answer. I think when you start recognizing that you're just pumping out echoes, I didn't want to be that. You know, I was I was on a trajectory, Kelly, um, you know, the Ryan Seacrest path the I was just behind Carson Daly. Like I was doing that thing at the peak of my CMT time. I, I jokingly say I couldn't, there wasn't a Walmart in Arkansas. I couldn't go into without getting mobbed. <laughs> uh, country music crowd. Um, but I was very uneasy. I, I, you know, my parents, we'd go out to dinner. I'd meet them out. And my dad really liked his son, you know, being, I don't, of course I don't blame him. I'd be proud too, but he would mention it to the, to the, to the you know, to the waiter, waitress, you know, who that is. Dad, you know, I didn't like fame um, because all I felt people were seeing of me was what I showed them. But when I was out in public, it was like, ah, but this is just me. What you're seeing is real me. What I present to you is real me, but it's a version. It's a it's a fine tuned, fair, crafted version of me. So at the ends of all these things, you're saying, how do you transition? It's when I realized like, oh, I'm just echoing that that character that I made and, and it's not filling my soul anymore. And, you know, I tried so many different things. And when I was on the, uh, the daily buzz is something we haven't talked about. It's a, it was a morning infotainment news show. It was nationally syndicated. We were in 96, 96, 97 markets. I mean, we would compete with the today show in certain markets and beat them in Seattle and Detroit. And uh, that was me pretending to be a TV anchor for a couple of years. Um, but I, I did. I left that early. And it was always when I recognized that um, I, that I wasn't getting personally anything out of it anymore. And I was just delivering delivering something that wasn't true to me. Just echoing, echoing the thing. And it's time to go. And it's like if you're going to speak to an audience, if you're going to speak, if you expect an audience to lean into you and honestly you know, share an intimate moment. If you're going to be in someone's living room, someone's bedroom, I don't know where the TV is, um, your phone, it's in your pocket. I mean, that's an intimate thing we're, we're having here. So you got to be genuine. You're genuine. I know this of you. I, I'm a really good, really good. Like that is my expertise is human behavior, judging character. I can see people. I know when people are BSing and when they're not. And you're, you got the thing. That's why you do this. You do this. And I've, I've seen your videos, I've listened to your podcast, I've watched you. It burns in you, right? So you ask yeah. me, why, well, how do you transition? It stops burning. <laughs> well, you know? Lance, take us, take us to the place though. Take us to the place because a lot of people don't understand that, that part of it. And even with myself, like, hey, there's contract on the table. There's money on the table. Here we go, Lance. This is what you wanted, right? But you were saying I, I was in love with the, not in love with the light. I was in love with the, the other part, right? Yeah, but yeah, yeah. here's all these things, Lance, exactly what you wanted. And then Lance mm. goes, mm. take mm. us to that place. What are you feeling not emotionally? What, yeah. what are you seeing? Yeah. Um, where are oh, you it was I mean, is it in an office? Is it an email? Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, it was, it was, it was CMT leaving them was a lot of offices, a lot of emails, a lot of phone calls. I mean, it was weird leaving them. I was 30, uh, I was 32, 33, when I, 32 when I left them. Um, yeah, 32. And uh, it was strange. It was strange having Viacom call me and say, why are, they couldn't believe that. I remember, I remember an executive, he and I, we butted heads a lot. I butted heads with my executives a lot. The secret to me staying at CMT and the HR department told me I had 
friends. I had moles on the inside. The executives didn't like me. They didn't. Because the executives that were there when I left weren't the executives that hired me. There's lots of change over the top. Let me tell you something about corporate executives. Not all of them. Some of them are great. Some of them are beautiful people that I, I hold close to my heart. A lot of executives in the corporate field fail their way forward. Let me repeat that. They fail their way forward. They messed up here, but your resume is so good. You were, oh, you were in the C-suite. Well, come on over here. It's not unlike football. Head football coach goes 0-17 comes head football coach next year some other team what what <laughs> okay i don't know i had executives that i butted heads with and the reason i butted heads with them is because i did not fit their ideal of what a tv host is and i knew that i didn't fit the mold I, you know why because i knew our audience i was adapting to the audience not the executives and i'll never forget sitting in this guy's office and he said lance i mean it was weird it's like they were all doing not good cop, bad cop, just a bunch of good cops. Like, come on, stay with us, stay with us. And I was miserable. I was so unhappy personally and just in my life and like what I was doing. And I never forget, he looked over and he pointed to a stack of like file folders. You could see headshots poking out. He goes, that is a stack of actors and personalities that want your job. Look at that. You walk out that door. It's like one of those guys is going to get it. And I was like, well, that's true. But no one in that stack is me. Like, yeah, you're going to replace me with somebody, but you're not going to replace me. So you should be thinking along those terms. I, I know that sounds cocky and arrogant, but I just was like, I'm taking my talents and going to South Beach. I don't know. I, I just was like, I, I'm not here. You said you got what you wanted, you know, in your question. And it was like, I realized I didn't, I didn't have what I wanted. I had close. I, what I wanted was to be an actor. That was the thing that always pulled me in. Always, that was my light. The CMT thing, you know, all the other jobs that came along, they were the doors that opened along the way. And I was happy to take those opportunities, but it, they never, I was always looking for that thing once I entered that door to be like, you are home. And as I wasn't home, I was just eating snacks while I was in that room. And now I'm out that door and I'm on down. <laughs> Light's pulling me. Light's pulling me. So my transition was always just this like, Looking back on it, it was like many people thought I was foolish for leaving any of these jobs, be it the Daily Buzz, be it CMT. And and it was always just like, it's not, it's not you, it's me. I wasn't like, oh, CMT's gone downhill or, oh, the Daily Buzz. No, it was always me. It was ending a relationship because I had grown out of it. That was the transition. Yeah, the money's on the table, but if I take it, I'm going to be a slave to this thing that I've built that isn't me anymore. It's going to get, it's going to grow uglier and make me, I mean, I went through a serious depression, man. My transitions weren't easy. The decision to leave was easy, uh -huh. but the transitions came with a sense of, um, of great depression and, and anxiety. Oh my God. My first panic attacks and anxiety, um, big, big signs of like, take control, run, go. And, and listening to that, and it isn't, I wasn't retreating and hiding. I was just getting out of that lane. So, man, transitioning is just, yeah, I was in an office. I was on the phone lots of times, and it was always just voice in the head. This is not you. This is not you. How do you know That's which it. voice? Because I have a lot of them. Some of them say, mm -hmm. like, you, you should eat some hot dogs today. Some of them <laughs> say you should uh, intermittent fast. Some of them say yeah. you should wake up early. Others say to me, you know what? You deserve to stay in this bed this morning. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. Lance, you, you seem to be an incredibly clear dude. How do you know which voice? Mm. I think maybe that's just it. I think you know what the voices sound like. And I think you know <laughs> when the voice is, that's, that's not the voice. But you listen to it anyway. You have that snack. You stay in bed. We listen to those voices. But that true voice that you're talking about, mm -hmm. I, I can't speak for anybody else. Um, and I, I don't, I, I, I like listening to people that have been there. I like listening to the thought leaders and lead, people today that have made great accomplishments and done things that, the only time I, but when I hear them say, you should, this is what you need to do. It's like, ah, I, it's and, and no disrespect to anybody that wants something better for other people that wants to coach them into it. Yeah. 
But what, you should are the that's that those two words to me are nails on a chalkboard. So I for me are nails on a chalkboard. So I try not to say here's what you should listen to, but here's what I listen to. That voice sounds like my mom. Wow. That voice is the voice of Leona Smith, who I need to call today. Um, that's my mom's voice. Yeah, my conscience is my mother. I, you know, I've I've never met a human being um, that's as close to what you could imagine an angel to be. Mm-hmm. My mother is the strongest woman I've ever met in my life. Um, I I do things and live in ways that she would disapprove of constantly. Um, <laughs> but those those are things for me uh, in my life choices. But in terms of greater choices, larger choices, the the listening to your heart, it sounds like Leona Smith. And, um, you know, so, if, yeah, I, it's just when you when you block out all those other voices that you talk about and you find that one true one, it speaks the softest, but is the loudest still. Um, I don't know. You just know. I auditioned for uh, MTV had this uh, had this. Uh, contest they want to be a vj i don't know if you remember that uh-huh. mtv had want to be a vj they had it uh two one or two seasons this is in 99 2000 i'd been in la and i knew that was coming and closest city to nashville was st louis and i flew home i had planned it out i was like i have what it takes to be a vj i know this i'm gonna be an mtv vj i will be i mean it was just how i just knew it pack my bags plan my shtick I knew every song on the on every channel, every video, every. I was Mister Pop Culture at twenty years old, and uh, drove to St. Louis, camped out all night. Lines of people, MTV's there, ma- making hype up. Thousands of people, snake through the line all morning. I've met people, I've gotten to know them. They're like, dude, you got the thing, you got the thing. I've talked about how I'm an audition. Get to the front of the line, and uh, she's like, uh, license and social security card. And I was like, I don't have my social security card. She says, you have to have your social security card. I was like, well, I have my license. And I said, oh, and here's like a, here's a, here's a, um, a check stub <clears throat> from like some acting work I had done. But my social security number's on it. How about that? Woman denied me. I didn't get a chance to audition. And I had been building this up for weeks. I traveled there. I stayed up practically all night, slept in the parking lot with a bunch of people. I didn't get a chance, Kelly. I mean, my, th- this is where my heart's being ripped out. I can take, I've auditioned and gotten no's. I've given terrible auditions and deserve the no's. And I know that. But I've, I didn't get, a, I don't, this is my chance. This is my thing. And dude, I mean, I, I the way home, driving home from St. Louis to Nashville, the strangest thing, I had the strangest calm about me. And it was this voice. Like, dude, you're, you're, you're still going to get it. You're, you're fine. It's not, it's a, it's nothing. I didn't get a chance to do the, I want to be VJ competition. And four months later, I auditioned for CMT four months, four months. I auditioned for CMT and I got it. And I auditioned with thousands of people <laughs> and I got it. And it was, and it was that, and I'll never forget the sound of that voice. Um, prior to that, prior to that, I had gotten an opportunity. This is even before all that stuff. Got an opportunity to be uh, um, a stand-in for Robert Redford's film. Uh, what was it? I, not the prison. I should I should know the name of this. this is a, I'm just remember this now. He did a prison movie um, in Nashville, and I got a chance to be not his stand-in, be a stand-in for the uh, character that played alongside. And I, I had said no to it because of the time commitment. I was like, ah, I feel like there's something else there, and it was that voice again, and uh, and it ended up being. The Dixie Chicks audition. And if I'd gotten the stand-in job, I wouldn't have got the Chicks audition. If I didn't get the Chicks... It all... Every time that I've gotten big things and I've listened to that voice, it's all because I had found a peace within myself. Now, if I'm kicking rocks and I'm screaming and I'm punching walls and I'm upset about the doors being shut or what I'm not getting, I don't hear that voice. If I create too much noise in my own head, I don't get to hear that voice. What were the things that uh, Mama Smith either showed you or said to you growing up that helped to be able to foster this type of attitude? Because, you know, you you have, I mean, 
you've showed in the last 40 minutes that it's not about the circumstances that you have. It's about the way in which you react to them. But what were some of those foundational things that she, mm. that she laid uh, and, and maybe showed or told you? Yeah. You know, her being, I guess my voice, it's like, I guess you know, it's my conscience in a lot of ways too. Um, you know, I grew up in the church. She, she, you know, Sunday school, Bible school, the whole nine. And, uh, that was a big influence of mine. And even in high school, um, is it, so mom's very like biblically based, uh, I don't know if the specific things she said. I mean, I do remember, and this is biblical. I don't know where I'm not a student of the Bible, but, uh, know some things here and there. Uh, but she said, uh, keep your house in order, get your house in order, get your house in order. And that's, um, and that, you know, and like that literally like clean your house clean. I'm deal with that. Now I have a six year old, two teenagers, all <laughs> girls, uh, get your house in order. But then that goes on to like, get your affairs in order. Mom was always about like, you know, we had messy houses. We had messy vans, um, you know, dried French fries tucked in the cracks, everything. It's not, it's not like we were like neat freaks. But mom was very much like keep, keep things in perspective and keep yourself ready. I think that's the biggest thing I got from her was keep keep your house in order. And the house is, you know, you can apply that everything. Your house, this house, this house, this house. Uh, yeah, that, I, that echoed a lot. And, uh, and, you know, we had a lot of changes. We had, I didn't have the easiest uh, childhood, but didn't have the hardest either you know, keep things in perspective. And it was always just always be ready, always be ready. And mom, my God, that woman. Yeah, always uh, eyes on the Lord, that lady. <laughs> what was some, what was something that maybe you haven't told her that, that it, maybe it wasn't a, a thing that she said, but that you watched and I'll give you an example. <clears throat> Growing up, my parents split up. I, I came home, I got whooped. Uh, my dad, we went to, um, to church and they said, don't spare the rod. And my dad came home and was like, he listened to him literally and just whooped yeah. me and my brother because the pastor said, and yeah. I had marks on the back of my leg. And my, I was changing. My mom said, what's with marks? And I, I, I said it and my mom snatched us up. We were in the process of moving, but she snatched us up, grabbed a backpack full of clothes, threw us in the car, me and my two brothers, and we took off. And yeah. my parents split at the time, and we slept on my uh, mom's friend's couch uh, for about two wow. weeks until she got an apartment, a one-bedroom apartment. Um, we had four people in it at the time and five people later on. But when I saw her do what she had to do at the time she had to do it, it changed yeah. my life forever. And it wasn't something that she said. She didn't say, kids, we're going to do this. She just did it. What was a moment like that for you with mama that you saw her and that you still utilize today? Man, uh, I, you know, I, I can't say that there's like one event. There's not a single sort of event that would, that would encapsulate that, but it is the, the sum of her life. And I'll say that because my brother is 10 years younger than I am. And he has what's called Angelman syndrome. Um, Angelman syndrome, it's a depletion of the 15th chromosome, much like uh, Down syndrome, you know, has a similar chromosomal. Uh, I think there's an additive with chromosome, but with my brother, it's deficiency. Anyway, it, it's, it changes the outcome, uh, but he is developmentally, developmentally delayed. He's 33, uh, 34 now, um, but he... Um, He's a little smaller in stature, but he's much bigger than my mother still. My mom is smaller than five feet. She was five feet growing up. I think she's come down a little bit. Love you, Leona. Uh, she knows. <laughs> uh, but she has cared for my brother, I mean, as we all have. But I mean, my mom is his world. He can't speak. He's, a, he's, a, he's like a big two-year-old in a lot of ways. Now, he can, he can feed himself. You know, but he can't exactly take him. He can take himself to the bathroom a little bit, but he needs assistance. I'm, t I'm giving you this to understand the level of care that he needs. He takes a daily medication to block seizures. Um, and he's stubborn as all get out because uh, he's my brother and he's the son of Jim Smith. Uh, we're stubborn, us Smith boys. My parents, you know, they've been through a lot together. They're still together and they raise him. But my mom's strength 
is unmatched. Um, she committed her life to taking care of not just, well, first of all, you know, in the, in 1989, when he was born in July, um, he, they knew right away that he was going to be severely, severely handicapped. At first there was a, something called as Prader Willie, Prater Willie. That's what they were thinking. Angelman syndrome was not even in the scope of what they were looking at. And then when he was born, he was, they found, oh, he can move. Originally, he was supposed to basically be in a vegetative state. And that was it. And they, they were determined to go through with the pregnancy. They were offered by a lot of doctors to terminate the pregnancy. And my mom, that wasn't, she, you know, she said, no, we're going, we're going through with this. And they did. And he ended up having, you know, basically when he was born, he's a normal infant, just like all the other infants. It's just his development is what's delayed. And eventually it sort of plateaus off and then his mindset is what it is he communicates in his own ways by pointing to things he's big on magazines and ipods and ipads and he can touch stuff but anyway my parents knew what they had in front of them and they accepted it and they leaned into it and he taught me a lot um being 10 11 years older i helped raise him uh and he had these severe you know needs these special needs uh he put things in perspective for me i could never get too high and mighty uh you know you come home to what your mother's dealing with who your brother is dad's working his butt off doing 16 other jobs we got through as a team but mom it, it's what she's devoted her life to and my brother that i can't complain about anything I mean, just her, her devotion to him, her devotion to my father, her devotion to me, but her devotion to my brother is, is one of the most, it's, I can't, I can't even put into words, um, how giving and so selfless she is, you know, she's a hero. And, and there's so many, so many, many, many mothers out there who have special needs children who are just trying to get by every day. You know, they get as much government assistance as possible here and there, but it's never enough. And it is hard. And it, it defines your life if you have a special needs child. So, uh, yeah, mom, mom's strongest woman I've ever met. Mm. You just said something about you with your, with your bro. What's his name? Taylor. With Taylor, you can't get high and mighty because he brings you right back down to earth, um, right? Yeah. And so yeah. um, I, I refer to it as giving you the business. That's what my wife, my, yeah. my wife does to me. My son, my daughter, 14, she gives me the business. Oh, yeah. God bless you. But when you, when you were talking about uh, that you, you can't get too high on yourself, um, take us to the divorce time because that was a time when, when we were talking before we uh, started recording that – you know, you talked about that getting too high kind of was a factor. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, you know, I keep that stuff private. That's, that's a lot of that's her story. And mm -hmm. we're, you know, we, uh, it was a tough situation because that's what divorce is, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but I, many people have it much, much, much harder speaking strictly for my side of things um not even about the the you know this illusion of that particular marriage between those people just speaking as the groom in that scenario just me it's like that was a product of this place that i had entered into mentally i had built this thing up um it wasn't fair to her either you know to to have to sort of witness the deconstruction of uh, of Lance, an uh, early midlife crisis, perhaps, I don't know. Um, I had, I had over a decade of, of, of being this person that I had, I had created. It was me, but it was this extension of me. And then still not having, still not having a, a feeling grounded. It's not having a thing that I felt was real to my heart, to my soul. I was doing a job, but when that job is your face, when that job is your name, that's what was tearing me down. And I had to look at it all, not just the job, but what the job 
gave me and then what the job was providing and then where I who <laughs> it's like with that uh, talking head song this is not my house this is not my beautiful wife <laughs> you know I like what is going on um so getting to the big d the divorce that is the hardest thing that I had ever come to not about us not breaking up going through that it is not a breakup it is a life altering thing that's happening um so admitting it getting to like that the realization of that you know for some people that's the band-aid you do it quick and you, you, you roll but you know it does it's not that easy you have to process but i will say and to anyone going through it leading up to it uh, if you know it's there, yeah, you go through it and you do it. And you you apply the Band-Aid approach as much as you can. You'll process over time. But what you will find is that it was worth it. And when I say it was worth it, it was because that's what you needed. If you came to the conclusion that this is what you absolutely need, and, you, and you're, you're, you, you are a thousand percent, the pain's going to suck. But you get through it and... It is what you needed. And if it's not what you needed, you can be like my aunt. They remarried three times. <laughs> um, but, it, but man, the, the admission to yourself that, you, you know, that the word failure comes into play. Mm -hmm. Did you fail? Did you fail yourself? You know what I, the most guilt, I, the hardest thing now that I, I don't think about the divorce. I don't. I think about her. I mean, we, she and I, were, we still talk uh, occasionally, you know. Happy birthday message and what's, whatnot. Uh, we both have the lives that we were looking for. Again, not to speak uh, on her life, but for me, you know, that's what I have. And you, you think about all the people that were at your wedding. You think about the people that got you gifts. You think about all the congratulatory stuff. What I look back on in hindsight is I had built a life that was expected of me by those in my life, by those around me. I had built the thing up that those, that everyone expects that I should have. So I did, I catered to that. I was doing that in my professional life, so personal life too. Convincing everyone, including myself. But when, you, when, you, when you're going through the divorce, you admit it to yourself that you need it long before you could admit it to other people. And it's letting family down. That is the hardest thing is that you're telling everyone that you would convince the world that this is who I am, this is what I need. And you're saying, ah, I was wrong. But you know what? You weren't. In the time, that's, that is, that, that's where you were at the time. You now have to convince the family and those same groups of people, this is what I need. And you'll find out that they love you just the same. And they'll hug you just the same. And they're happy for you. you probably even more so because you did something for yourself that, you know, you do everything with purpose, right? Divorce with purpose too. Like it's not just about getting at them or slamming doors. If you're doing that, that's not divorce time. You're still working through something. But if you're if you're admitting that this major thing is done, well, then there must be a major thing that's coming next. And you got to do that with purpose too. <laughs> it's a hard thing, man. It is. It is. And when I say it, I'm not coming from a judgment stand, stance. I'm, no. I'm divorced also. I went through those things. and But most of the time, I didn't have a person to sit down and, and have a conversation mm. with yeah. to, that, that understood going through it. Because I grew up with parents that stayed together. I mean, they, they split up at times and came back together and stuff like that. Yeah. But I think in my, my crew, I was the first one. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, most most of my friends were like, we could have told you on your wedding night that that was going to happen um, or leading up to it. They, that's what they told me. And, you know, yeah. but how do you know when you go through those times, you, you talked about a little bit of depression or whatever it is. How do you know not to listen to the depressive voice or the depressed voice? Because when you're in that dark, sometimes the only voice that you're hearing is the dark voice. Darkness is loud, isn't it? Darkness is so loud. Uh, the light isn't. The light is like, come to me. And it, like, it makes you work for it. But the darkness is like, you are doomed. 
You will never be great at anything. No one will ever love you. Nothing good will come of this. Why did you even wake up this morning? Like the darkness is loud and obnoxious. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. How do you not listen to that? Um, uh, motion, move, get up, do like that. That's the thing because the darkness can't move. The darkness can't keep up with you. The darkness is loud, but he's got little bitty legs. And he's he's like, hey, I, was, I was talking to you. I was talking to you. And you're like, oh, I'm, I'm running to the light. I'm running to the light. That's how. Move. That's how you don't listen to the darkness. Because the, the, the couch, the chips, <laughs> the, the TV, <laughs> like the thing. Like, I've been there. Been there. Move. Move. And that, that might literally just be move. Run. Running is like a, it was a life-saving thing to me. I haven't run in a while or, you know, got to get back into it and I can feel it. Um, but I get in, get in my modes, my stages, but if not move, if, if, if exercise ain't your thing, do something and more specifically do something for someone else. Ooh. Watch what you do impact someone. And that doesn't mean like, Oh, I've, I now need to be a philanthropist like with your ten dollars in your pocket no um no you know it doesn't mean you like always need to be in service to people like we should but like that you know help someone hey, go go into that part because when, when you said be a the philanthropist with ten dollars in your pocket i think a lot of times people are like i need to really do something so i'm gonna start a foundation well what are you gonna do i'm gonna just ask other people for money what? Yeah. Like, go get a job. Go get a job yeah. and do something. But, but talk about that. Talk about that a little bit. That, that made me belly laugh right now. I just got your abs. Service is good. <laughs> your, service, your service is far more valuable. There's always a need for you to do what you do. Quit wallowing. It's hard to listen to that. If you're in a depressive state, it's hard to hear any kind of, hey, let's go get them motive. And no one wants to hear that. When you're sad, you want more sadness. When you're sad, you listen to sad songs. Because, um, it, I don't know, it makes you feel maybe... At least I'm not that sad. Uh, but it's just do it. It's that whole like putting one foot in front of their like like learning to walk as a toddler. Like they just sort of trust they're gonna catch themselves or all head first. Like that's how you might be in your first service activity, or that's how you might be doing anything. I'm gonna get involved in something, and you're gonna look like a toddler walking. You're gonna look like a little drunk human dropping things, and and it's gonna be awkward. But in the, in hindsight, you're like, oh, look what I did. Look look how far I've come, you know? And if it's only off the couch, great. You made it that far. Um, so, again, the darkness is loud and it is obnoxious, but it can't, it does not, it can't keep up with you if you're moving. If you're making any effort to move forward, you're leaving it behind. So that's the best way I know how to deal with 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 that sort of thing. And then, yeah, and if it's not money, I mean, yeah, you can... You may want to listen to like all the motivational speakers and all the prosperity guys and and here's what you do get get involved and get money and do this and money and do this and money and like yeah th that can be motivating <laughs> you got to have a plan to want to do something with it um and if you're not in that space yet who's doing it and what can you how can you help them you know they got the money and they're doing something they're the philanthropists offer your services your service will will pull you out of any kind of any kind of rut um, even if it's not anything related to what you want to be doing, um, it's just action, just motion. Be like a shark. Sharks, you know, they always, although I've seen sharks sit at the bottom and sleep. I know what they say about they die. <laughs> but you know, well, you, you know the metaphor. <laughs> I've seen lazy sleeping sharks. <laughs> so, so Lance, your, your movie is called A Time for Every Purpose, okay? Some people have a challenge with this. It might be, this guy, because when I say this, whenever I hear a purpose or I see a vision, like God gives me a plan, I'm like, cool, let's make it happen now. And mm -hmm. what you're saying to me is that there's a time for every purpose. Now, I, I, I don't like this because <laughs> I, I love the movie. Don't get me wrong. I think it's amazing. Awesome. But the fact that I don't get what I want when I want it, Lance, help yeah. a brother out. Yeah. Yes, because it's not it's not your time. Like everything in life we look back on and it all happened when it was supposed to, you know, 
America was founded in 1776, not 1376. You know, all the everything in history, it all lays out so perfectly, doesn't it? So why not now for my life? Why doesn't it? Why can't I read forward the same way? And, you know, the way I see that and the way we constructed the movie and the story, this was a story that was written by my friend Quentin, uh, Quentin McCary, and he then had someone turn it into a script and then it came my way and I was like, we're close, but there's even more to, to, to pull out here. And what we did with this story was try to, you know, we have these four individuals who are going through this each, they're going through individual crises, crises. Um, and they're all different. You know, we have a pastor struggling with his, uh, his ability to lead a congregation. We have a teenager in high school who's gone through a tragedy and he can't get over it because of how everyone looks at him and it's his connection to it. We have a single mother who who has defeated her demons, who's who's but he's back. This her former abuser is back and she's got to deal with him again. I thought I had she's joined the church, she's turned her life around, she's clean, but then here he is again with his magic bag of drugs and um and uh, the, and then a a veteran with PTSD a war veteran who served in Afghanistan and cannot, the war will not escape his mind. He can't leave it behind. So we have all these people dealing with stuff and it's a lot of why me, why now, why me, why now? And so when we talk about a time for every purpose and it's, you know, of course, extrapolated from Ecclesiastes 3.1, um, where, you know, there's a time for every purpose under heaven. Of course, the Pete Seeger song, turn, 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 which the birds made. And we all know, we all know the song. All the movie is about and all that to me that that verse is about and that phrase, the saying a time for every purpose is not you got to wait on it. That's where people get it wrong because waiting on it ain't going to get you there. It's the movement and you got to deal with what you got to deal with because who you are is waiting for you on the other side of what you have to deal with. You'll discover your purpose when you get through what you got to get through. It's, it's there for you. Some people have to go through absolute horrendous situations. And it's it wasn't written for them. It's not faithful. It's just where they are. But if you can survive this, wait till you see who you're going to be on the backside of this. And so that's what a time for every purpose is. It's like you're not waiting on the purpose to come to you. You have to get in motion to go to it. And what's where it is, is always on the other side of some adversity, adversity, small and large. Some people's adversity is, you know, paying off a student loan. Some people's adversity is a day to day. You know, we don't all have like, oh, I'm, you know, in this film, it is a bit of a soap opera. It's, these are outlandish problems. It's a movie. You know, we gotta, we gotta like push your buttons a little bit. We've got, it's gotta be extreme, but some people's in lives, you know, it's, it's, it may be small relatively, but pain is relative. And so yeah. whatever you're dealing with in your life, you know, maybe it doesn't seem as bad as what your friend or your neighbor is dealing with. Maybe you, you've you got a really comfortable income and you feel guilty about feeling like this thing that I'm dealing with is, is an adversity. But it is. It's your adversity. It's your adversity right now. And if you just wait for it to disappear, it probably won't. And you're not going to you're not going to discover who you are on the other side. Therefore, you're not going to get your purpose yet. And what your purpose will eventually become will be whatever you became of you in this moment of sitting still. So that to me is what it's about. It's about battling through, mm. getting through the thing and that your purpose is on the other side. And then there is the time for every purpose a time the time is when is it has arrived but you have a part in that you have a part in that you have to face it head on hell or high water win lose or draw you know what if you take it on and you fail well then that then therein lies your purpose now <laughs> what do you, what are you what are you learning from it now you didn't get it okay what's in front of you now what are your circumstances now what is your environment now, because you say that failed. Well, are you sure that that was your purpose? No. You know, why were you so sure that was it? Mm. Why were you so sure that was it? You'll discover it in its right time. <laughs> and you'll know then. You'll know. That's why it's like my audition for, for MTV, you know, happened and that failed. And I had that voice. You'll be fine. 
you know, the, the stand in job. Nah, I don't think that's it. It's, it was the Dixie Chicks job that happened. Um, you know, CMT, I, I was losing my mind because I had, I felt I had to constantly then give in to this Frankenstein monster that I created. And I, I had this piece and I found myself and then, and, and this is for finally for me. And this is where I feel like I've hit my stride is at 45, this whole time, that light, that light, I want to be an actor. I want to be an actor. Yeah, I'll host right now, but I'm still an actor. I want to be an actor. I want to be an actor. I want to be an actor. No, dude, I was a director the whole time. I started teaching acting six, seven years ago, and it was my friends. A friend of mine came to me and said, I've got this script. I've got about 5,000 bucks for a pilot. It's like, uh, you know, would you direct it? I'm like, directing? I don't like about directing. I said, yeah, you do. You direct actors, and that's what directing is. And I felt intimidated because what do I know of? I know a lot more now, but, you know, what do I know of cameras and, and, and lenses? And, and I learned. I learned on the job, but my, what I'm an expert in is human behavior. What I'm an expert in is directing actors and drawing out truth and creating moments. And I was everything that I've been doing in class, I started applying to this. And then I directed a short. And then I, a friend of mine was like, hey, I got a production company. I need to do some commercials. Will you direct them? Yeah, I started directing commercials. And then in 21, uh, script came along, opportunity came along, angel investor came along. We got about a quarter million dollars for budget, had a, a bunch of extra soft equity. And... In the process of making a time for every purpose, the the process of making the film too. Like we had so many incidents where it's like, there's no way this is lining up. There's no way. I had atheists working on the on the film. I'm a bit. I grew up in the church, but I, I I'm a bit of a doubting Thomas. I don't lie. <laughs> I am, but I but I lean forward and I push and I keep. I yearn. I search. I ask questions. But the making of this film I had atheists working on. I come to me and go, Are you going to make me a believer? Like I might try, man, just, just stay, stay with this. And dude, coming out of this film, not only am I like, oh yeah, I'm not an actor. I'm a director. I'm a storyteller. And all this career and this life that I've lived and this study of human behavior on my own time at six and seven years old and at 13 years old and at 17 and 20 and 25, all the way through learning the business. It's all, it's all an amalgamation of what I do now. And now I'm like my entire life at 45, I'm like the end of an M night Shyamalan film. Like oh, he was a ghost the whole time. You know, it's like, <laughs> Oh, I was a director the whole time. That's where I'm at now, Kelly. And, and it's exciting. Um, but it is all this, a time for every purpose stuff. The fact that the film is this, I didn't, I didn't write the title. I didn't, I didn't come up with the story. I rewrote the dialogue, but like, and that's where I got to infuse my personal faith that's where i got to infuse my story my own thing um but it was a collaborative effort and and this movie is like such a a signal of my own personal journey and it's none of it's about me <laughs> it's wild there was a line in the movie um by uh, i believe it was the sing the single mom she said how do i stay in the uh, this town when everybody wants me to leave Oh yeah, Reggie's mom. Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. when I when I heard that and now I hear your story, help me to understand because a lot of times people that are at a crossroads are going through that place where everyone in the in their town or in their place is wanting them to leave and telling them you should leave, you should leave, you should leave. And yeah. she's asking I uh you know, she was asking someone, "How do I stay?" Mm -hmm. when yeah. everyone's telling me to leave. Yeah, I mean, you know, that kind of the, that crowd. Why are they saying it? You know, why? What? 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 For what reason? And what are you doing? Are you? Is your job? Is your mission? Is your purpose to push back against them? Are they your mission? What do you? Or, or is your mission just whatever it is you're doing, and that their response would be a reaction to what it is you're doing? But your mission isn't them, and your mission isn't pleasing them, whatever them is, you know, this is all metaphor, of course, we're speaking, yeah. but yeah, if you're in it, if you're in a situation where it's like, you feel unwanted, why do you want to be there? Are you, do you want yourself there? And if you come to the answer, no, I'm in the right place. It is a, it's a balance of tuning them out. Why are they, why are you letting them affect you? You know, why could they be saying they don't want you here? Why are you not wanted? Um, and if you if you don't know that, if, it, if it, then don't spend any more like 
it's just one of those things like, oh, did I, did I do something? Did I knock over something in the room? Did I, then if your answer, if you know that there, it's just because there's like, it's just negative, it's just social, it's just, it's petulant. It's, uh, I, that is one area I, I, it's okay to be, um, I don't want to say arrogant, <laughs> but I, I look down on people. I, I, not all people. I look down on people, not because I'm bigger than or better than. They just got real small. And I can't help that you're down there. I can't help that I have to look down. You made it that way. You know, like, oh, like, they're your disposition. Like, I, I might hear it. I might weigh it. But like, oh, you're just you're just being a child or you're you have no idea what you're talking about. Now, I will say that there is a common instinct. And this is something that took me, God, decades of my life to get over. And this is just comes with life experience. But the hardest part of growing up for me as a teenager, and then I extended this into my career, and this is where I sp would spin my wheels a little too much, was my need <laughs> to prove to other people that I was X, Y, Z. I need you to see me like this. I don't know if I really am like this, but I need you to see me this way. I need to constantly know that you know that I am X, Y, Z. And that's dangerous. That's dangerous because are you? And why do you care? Why is the mission their vision of you? Your mission should be the thing that you're building or making or turning yourself into. Their vision of you will be, will be automatic. They will see what you're doing as you do it, when you do it, and when you're done. But all of that, that stuff is like, oh, your focus is on their focus. Your focus is on their gaze. You're focused on them. When I coach, I, I, when I coach actors or hosts, I, I coach a lot of people. I coach public speaking. I coach CEOs. And again, I do all the wrong things. I break the rules. <laughs> I'm a bad public speaker on paper because I do all the things that Toastmasters says not to do. That's fine. That's just me. It's how I roll. Because my thing is truth. And I, I discovered when I was working with CEOs and just how to deliver keynote speeches or whatever, you know, do corporate stuff. And I'm working with actors. The thing that I found when I'm coaching these people or athletes, I work with athletes a lot, getting them, you know, uh, you know, uh, media, media training, media ready. Um, Non-performers, I, I have to get them to perform. I'm like, oh, you, you got an audience here. They're, they're, they, you, this information that you have, you have to have a need to get it out. It has to matter to you first, and then you say it. If you say it before it matters to you, it's not going to matter to them. They're not going to hear it. It has to matter to you first before it comes out of your mouth. It has to move your soul before it does anything in your body and leaves your, your mouth via your voice or your eyes. You communicate not with your voice or your body. It, like I speak this way because I believe what I'm saying. It has to matter. With actors, I have to get them to stop performing because it's not about truth. It's about you, right? It's about you. So you have to get to the truth of the message. So you, your folk, if your focus is on the perception, like, then what are you doing? Oh, well, I'm, I'm, imagine if race car drivers were just worried about what the crowd watched. Do I look good driving this car? Do I look nice? Do I look cool? <laughs> Right? You'd wreck. You'd miss the first turn. You'd take everybody out. You would suck at race car driving. You've got to focus on the road. Let them let them watch. But you gotta focus on the road. So, you know, um detractors, naysayers, the 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 voices, the what are you doing it for? What are you in it for? Why are you doing this? And again, that went back to what we talked about earlier. Why I made the changes. Oh, why am I doing this? What am I getting out of this now? You know? But if you're doing this, oh, no, because I need to make this thing. But I'm just so worried about what they see me doing. Oh, okay, well, you, your need is to make the thing. Your need is not to worry about them. That's it, man. That is it. You know, I, we, when we made the film and we put it out, I was like, it's a, it's a faith-based movie. It's a Christian, quote-unquote, Christian film. But it is not typical. It has some language in it. And uh, we didn't do that to be to be outlandish. We didn't do it to be brazen in any way. We didn't. Do, we, we did it just because this is the story and this is the way this character talked in this scene. And that's it. And we're just being just honest. Um, and I, 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 I could have puked the night that we premiered it for the cast and crew and friends and family. 
And and this is how I know what I'm doing what I am meant to be doing because I care I care more about this than anything I've ever cared about in my entire career. I've been on television for over two decades. I've been on live television in front of millions. I've done major major things and interviewed, you know, all major celebrities and I like done big 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 stuff. Kelly, I never wanted anybody to watch. I did what I did. Like the peak of my time on television was just before. Instagram was taken off. I remember in 09, uh, I, at the end of the uh, episode of Top 20 I did, I told my, my producer, I was like, hey, I want to put in a little something script. And I said uh, to the crowd, I said, hey, uh, Twitter's a new thing now. Um, my show, my old handle was at Lance Smith Show. And I was going to do more with it. I found it to be what it is, a way to engage the audience in a more direct way instead of just the vertical website or whatever. And I put it out there, and I remember the executive word got back to me that he was in the watch down before it went out to broadcast. And he was like, Twitter, what is this? Is, what are you gonna put it? No, it's stupid. Nobody's gonna put a Twitter handle on a. He thought they thought it was ridiculous, and I was like, "What are you talking about?" Um. Anyway, I'm sorry, I, I go off on a million tangents, but <laughs> I, I was done. Uh, and and social media wasn't. It was about to take off, um. But I was at a point where. I was doing all these shows and I was on the number one rated show on the network, but I didn't want anybody to watch. Um, not that I would be like, I would deter them from watching. It's not that I, and not that I was ashamed of what I did, but I didn't, I didn't have this like, look at me factor. I didn't, I wanted the job. I wanted the host. I wanted the career. I wanted the paycheck. I wanted to do the gig. I loved crews. I loved the camaraderie. I love the making of TV and film. Like it's all so fun and wow and amazing. And yeah, I'll, I'll host because I can do that. I'm good on the in the spotlight. But I wanted to wear someone else's face. You know, I wanted to put on. And so I didn't want people to watch. So to bring this all circle back around to my film career and this this movie. I was I was I was sick to my stomach launching this thing because I cared about what people thought. Not 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 do I want them to think it's good, but did, did I did I move you or did I not? Did I steal ninety six minutes of your life or did I move you? Um, and it it mattered to me more than any other show I'd ever hosted, wow. more than any other opportunity I ever had is the release of this film and like. We don't have any money behind marketing and it's going to do whatever it's going to do. And I, you know, I hope that it picks up a grassroots swell and people like it, but it, I realize, like, Oh, this matters to me, not for the pat on the back and not for the recognition, but did I connect? Did I really connect? Because the irony now is that I finally have a job, not on camera, not doing this. I got a job behind camera that I feel like I have an ability to reach you more than I ever did when I was speaking directly on camera with a mic speaking, doing this right now, I can, I, I have a chance to like move an audience more behind the camera. And so this, this now is like, Oh, I'm in my, I'm, I'm in my, my seat. This is, this is my role. <laughs> Well, it, it's amazing because you even see it in you. Like if you're watching right now on YouTube, um, you can see like, like you changed when you began to talk about it. It, it was incredible. Lance, I started the uh, podcast because of my kids, um, Maddox and McKenna. Maddox is a little football player. He's a huge fan of the Titans. Um, we raised him right. Um, Good man. He marches to the beat of his own drum. This kid is like, he's like a cartoon character. Um, yeah. And then my daughter, who's an uh, aspiring actress, uh, she, and she's in the arts, and she's she's an incredible uh, young lady, 14. My son is 12. And oh, awesome. I started the podcast because of them, because I didn't want them to worship idols. I just wanted them to be inspired by icons like yourself. Yeah. And I wanted to show them that the Lance Smiths of the world, that face of CMT, the uh, host of the, uh, the Daily Buzz, the voice of the fans for the Tennessee Titans. Yes. MC of the Dixie Chicks, actor, producer, um, director, all these things. It's not because of what he does. It's because of who he is. And so mm. what advice would you have for Maddox and McKenna? And if he could use the, both their names, it would be awesome. Maddox and McKenna, 
you guys are, first of all, quite lucky that you have a dad who loves you and cares about you, but cares about people, cares about life, cares about this mission that we're on. Um, it, you guys, Maddox and McKenna and every 12 and 14 year old, everyone in between there, you guys are dealing with a world we never envisioned. You know, I'd mentioned the social media aspect of it. That is life altering. Our species, our human species, this animal that we are, we are not equipped to handle the connections that exist via that phone in your pocket. The phone's changed everything. It is everything. It is a, it is connects us to everyone in the world. It is a movie studio. It is an audio studio. It is it is all things, and we are tied to it. And it is a tool. But it is just that. And in that tool, it can unlock a lot of doors and it can open you up to a lot of experiences. But you have to remain self-aware. You need to distance yourself as much as you can from being too connected to those bubbles, to being too connected to those crowns. There's, there's an intoxication with, with going viral. Uh, we want our message out, but is it the message we want out or is it us? And so at your age, you're inundated with all the messaging of cool and all the messaging of now and all the messaging of, of measuring yourself to unrealistic standards. And if you stay that way and you stay constantly in the shadow of the great ruler, and I mean that as a measuring stick, <laughs> You know, if you stand in that place, years from now, you won't have a foundation and you won't know who you are. But the quicker, the quicker and sooner you understand who you are as a person and that you don't have it all figured out and that you're not supposed to. I think that's a, the, the big thing that tricks us up is that we, we feel like we're just trying to live and go to get to this place where it's, we finally were like, OK, I figured it out. OK, I've got everything. I'm at a place of having it all figured out by knowing that I don't have it all figured out. And, oh, I had wished that I had learned that sooner. So know that you don't know everything. Know that you only know what you know right now. And um, that the, the, the outside voices do not carry the weight that you think they do. And just like the darkness voice run, move, do something. And those voices fade because they don't travel. They're just loud in the moment when you sit still. Um, so know who you are, be, be self-aware and, and know what you, not what you want to do. You don't have to know what you want to be when you grow up. I didn't know I want to be a film director. I just <laughs> found myself later. Great. But know, know whatever light that is right now. No, then let it pull you and get involved. Stay involved. My, I have teenagers, 17, 14 year old girls. And, uh, I, I, I can't, I can't imagine growing up today with what all you have to deal with. You have to learn to shut it off. You have to learn to turn it off and uh, find, find what moves you now and, and watch them watch. <laughs> Lance, you have been uh, better than advertised. And I tell you, like, oh, my, I'm, I'm smiling. My face is hurting right now because I'm smiling so much because the, the consistency and congruency of your message, and for me, what was not what was nuts for me, is that path that you talk about. That's not, you know, you're not going to have this thing that you look at, and you're just going to go directly to it, and you're you're proof of that. But for me, the reason why I connected with you right off the bat is you were the voice of the fan of the, the fans of the Titans, and. <clears throat> When I reached out to you at first, I was like, oh man, that would be so cool to be able to sit and talk about Titans. And now I have a conversation with a friend that is very little about the greatest team that's ever been, which is the Titans. And we're going to end up um, 12 and four or 13 and four, oh, okay. 13 okay, and four. Like we'll have a good run. 13 and four. That's how we'll do it. But like it, it's, it's amazing because that message is through this conversation of, for me, I thought it was one way. I thought it was a certain result that was going to happen. Um, but it had very little, if anything, to do with that and had to do with more things that needed to hit me right now where I'm sitting and where I'm at in my life. And I just, I want to thank you for that, man. Yeah, man, absolutely. Look, man, life is, life is worth living. And, uh, 
but it's it's that's an that's an active verb living um and you know you gotta you gotta be open you gotta you gotta to hear those those messages and let them you know if you hear somebody say something does it did it affect you let it let it reverberate that's 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 why i make films that's why i do this stuff it's like what how can you i love it when you can move an audience and make them not tell them something make them question something make them look within and i love conversations like this kelly i mean like you do this podcast because this is who you are this is you know your your mission for joy and purpose and uh you know and then it's like what a what a what an amazing role model you are for your kids in that regard. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You, I mean, it, it's, you knew what you wanted when you wanted and you've gone after it. Do you feel like you through the course of these interviews that it's changed you in ways that you didn't expect? It has, because I think that uh, when I first set out, I was like, man, I want to go get the biggest names and then people will watch and then I'll see the, the amount of views. And what I realized throughout all of it is, you know, it it was about me hearing a message of, you know, like today when you were talking about the audience, you know, connecting with the audience, asking them questions and not putting on this facade or not trying to go viral in it, but the fact that I know, like this conversation today, if it, if it meant that I had this conversation and no one else heard it in the world, it would be worth it. Worth and, it to me then. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so that, yeah. that part, I've, I've learned that over time. And um, I've learned that I, what I expect is generally never going to happen. But yeah. it's going to be so much better if I allow the thing that was supposed to happen too. So, um, yeah. you know, I want to, I want to thank you at the highest level, man. I'm going to force you to be my friend. Um, I, now is the time where I want to thank all the, the audience members for helping us, uh, you know, watching, listening, sharing and subscribe on YouTube. Cause my son thinks I'm cool. If I have more subscribers, he's Maddox. And he, he asked me all the time, dad, how many subs you got? And, um, but I want to thank you for helping us to get into the top 1% globally. We didn't focus on it. What we focused on was uh, bringing you quality people like Lance that have done amazing things, but is an even better person. So I want to thank you, Lance. I'm going to force you to be my friend for the rest of your life. Um, done. I want you on the show again, man, uh, yeah. as many times as we possibly can. And before we go... A time for every purpose, a time for every purpose, a time for every purpose. You need to watch this movie. You need to share this movie because honestly, like when you see Lance and he talks about it and it comes from his heart, we need more things like that in the world that are coming from people's heart as opposed to what they think will sell. Thank you, man. I, that, that means a lot that you say that because that's really how we did it. I mean, we put this thing together and there was never... We never talked. We didn't talk about distribution. We didn't. Talk, in fact, like in hindsight, if any, if we did anything wrong, we maybe should have considered marketing and distribution. <laughs> um, but we, it was so important to my friend Quentin, who who came up with the story, and then in turn, it was important to me rewriting the story. You know, keeping the pieces there. But we were never like, ah, oh, we're gonna sell the movie. It was never a financial thing. Um, and, and in that hindsight of me, like, oh, I never wanted anybody to watch anything I did because I was always self-conscious. I was always like, ah, it's not about me, you know. And now I'm like, no, I, I do want people to see this movie. It, 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 it does affect people. It has purpose. It's not just entertainment. And, and I, you know, we, we put so much into it not to be a huge hit. We put so much into it because the story was genuine. We put so much into it because we were like, this we, This just needs to be as truthful and real as possible. We need to give this as much integrity as we can. And we did. I feel like we did. I feel like we we hit what we aimed for. And uh, and so thank you. It means the world for me to, to hear you say that. And yeah, time for your purpose. Uh, look it up. Search all video on demand. Amazon, Apple <laughs> Plus, you name it. Um, Search it. And uh, even YouTube movies, I think they do. It's, it's available. And then hopefully after its first, uh, I think it's a 90-day window, you know, there's talk of, you know, maybe a small theater run or maybe it'll land on one of the big streamers. We'll see. But, oh, I lost. Am I still here? That's okay. You're you're still oh, here, man. I want to 
I want to thank you so much because um, what you've been able to bring to the podcast today has been absolutely phenomenal, um, better than advertised. Oh, and uh, oh, you are back, and you're handsome too, man. Um, <laughs> but I, w- I want to thank you so much, thank man, you. and uh, and thank again the audience. And I want to tell you that you're officially off the hot seat, Kelly. You, uh, Kelly, you were awesome. This was really fun. This was like this lifted up. I'm gonna like the rest of the week. I'm-